behalf of Connect and the Southeast Mass STEM Network, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our diversity, equity, and inclusion program today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Stacey Kaminsky, and I'm the Executive Director of Connect, <laughs> which is the consortium of the six public institutions of higher ed in Southeastern Massachusetts. So those include Bridgewater State University, Bristol Community College, Cape Cod Community College, Massachusetts Maritime Academy, Massasoit Community College, and the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth. Connect provides oversight for the Southeast Mass STEM Network, which is expertly led by our network manager, who all of you know, uh, Catherine Honey. This is the fourth summer that we've hosted an event uh, in advance of STEM Week to help generate some excitement among our regional STEM stakeholders and enthusiasts, but only the second time that we've done so virtually. So I, I keep making the comment similar to last year, uh, this truly feels like an, a STEM experiment to me with a heavy emphasis on the T for sure. Um, luckily we were able to do this last week and it was fairly successful. Um, and we have people who have returned, so it couldn't have been too bad. So I'm, I'm encouraged by all of you who have returned for a second time, so thank you. Um, and as I said, we're so happy to see so many familiar faces, um, not only from week to week, but since last year and the previous years as well. Um, typically, the majority of our attendees um, come from the Southeast Mass region, but since we're virtual again this year, we're so happy to have many participants joining us from all of our regional networks, um, as well as their catchment areas. So thank you um, for all who have attended near and far. I'd just like to take this opportunity to review our agenda briefly and the information that I sent out on the breakout sessions. As you can see, we have whole group panel discussion this morning following my welcome remarks. And then we'll have a 15 minute transition period during which I'll move the workshop facilitators into their respective breakout rooms. Um, once I get all of them settled into their breakout rooms, I'll ask that you identify which breakout rooms you would like in the chat. Um, it is a little clunky, so I apologize for that, but we do have the 15 minute transition period um, worked in so that you won't lose any time in your breakout sessions or um, our facilitators, uh, breakout room facilitators won't lose any pre valuable presentation time. So um, our, present, our um, breakout rooms will run essentially from 10.15 to 11, and then from 11.15 to 12 o'clock, okay? Um, and we can talk more about that when, when we're making the transition, um, but I just wanted to give you a little heads up about that. So the three breakout rooms that we have will run concurrently and they will repeat in both sessions. The first is making positive changes. That's room one. Room two is plastic makes perfect. And room three is unpacking good intentions. Um, and again, we'll also have the 15 minute break between the, the two breakout sessions. Um, I also wanted to add the Commonwealth's fourth annual STEM week will be happening October 18th to the 22nd. And to register your organization's STEM event with the Southeast Mass STEM Network, please navigate to the link that's provided on the um, resource document that we'll be sending out after this week's event. Um, and I also have it included on the final page of the agenda. It's really the only thing on that page four. Uh, See Yourself in STEM is once again the theme for STEM Week 2021, and now more than ever, it's important to highlight how all students can see themselves in STEM. The forthcoming STEM and DEI resource document will include descriptions and links to the organizations that participated in our STEM and DEI program um, last week as well as today, and the links to career exploration activities and resources to support STEM Week activities and DEI initiatives. Now I'd like to introduce Kat Monteith, who will um, introduce our student speaker, Isabel Stacco from Brockton High. After Isabel has provided her remarks, I'm going to ask Dr. Laura Douglas, president of Bristol Community College and Connect Board Chair to introduce herself and begin the panel on urban and suburban community STEM and DEI models for making positive changes. So welcome, Pat. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here and let's have a great morning. Thank you so much, Stacy. I l always love your welcoming remarks. Um, for those of you who either know me or don't know me, you know that I wear several different hats. Um, for one, uh, I have worked with Paul Engel at the Brockton Library um, to put together and to run the makerspace there. Um, I've also, for the past seven years, 
been involved with the Brockton NAACP um, as co-chair of their ACTSO program, which is a competition for high school students. Um, and more recently, I've just taken over as co-chair of the South Shore Region 5 Science and Engineering Fair, which happens in March. Um, so I come from a number of different perspectives. Um, you know, I first met Isabel Stacco um, when I was doing some mock judging for Brockton High School under the incredible leadership of David Mangus, the uh, science department chair, who I've loved working with the past couple of years, to help her get ready for the regional science fair. Well, she competed in the science fair, and guess what? Two days later, the world closed down for COVID. Um, I was very impressed and told her about the AXO competition. Um, however, her project was locked in, um, almost like being locked in jail. Her bean beetles were locked in school, and it took several weeks to be able to free them up. Um, so she still ended up finding a way to complete her project, even though it wasn't quite the way she wanted, um, in time to be able to compete at the ACTSO NAACP Regional competition where she won a first place gold award and then went on to the national competition. For this past year, as a senior, with all the pressures of applying for college, Isabel decided to take on a much more challenging project, uh, learning about machine learning um, and artificial intelligence uh, and how that connects with brain cancer. That was not a light project. Um, she ended up winning awards at the regional and state competitions, as well as the NAACP local and national competitions. Um, Isabel, you know, <laughs> I, I hope you're not embarrassed when I say not only was she the class valedictorian, graduating first in her class among nearly 1,000 students at Brockton High School, but has received a full four-year scholarship to Yale University. We're so proud of her. And if this wasn't enough, Isabel is spending her time this summer volunteering at Massasoit Community College in Dr. Michael Bankson's B Project. <laughs> okay, um, let's hear from Isabel. Um, Isabel, you know, what would best highlight your efforts and the support you received from others on your quest for success? I would say the support I got during my journey originates from mainly the teachers and my mentors. I think there was a lot of times where throughout my journey, I thought I had a little bit of imposter syndrome, whether it was in the programs I participated in, or even in the science fair competitions when I saw projects that seemed to be so amazing and seemed to be so much better than mine. But getting that reassurance from both my STEM teachers, my mentors, and even from like non-science teachers. I had a English teacher junior and senior year that would do regular checks ups on my science fair project. And even though he knew absolutely nothing about my project or science, it meant a lot to me that he cared enough about my science project. And it made me feel like the work that I was doing was important no matter what I was doing and gave me that confidence I needed to continue taking that next step and step towards my career. Thanks, Isabel. You know, the representation of young people of color in the United States in STEM um, and in the STEM workforce and education pathways is far below their numbers in the general population. Considering this, what factors um, have contributed to the obvious success you've had in STEM? For factors that contributed to my success, I would say, first off, the support I got from teachers to help me realize that the work I'm doing was important. And more importantly, confidence and perseverance. For perseverance, I felt like a lot of the time, especially senior year, STEM felt like an eighth class that I had on top of my course load. There was many days where I did homework from, or I did school from like seven to two, and then I did homework from five to 10. And then after doing five hours of homework, I would do another two or three hours of machine learning. And I would do that night after night after night. And even though those things were extremely fun to do, after a while, as anyone would expect, it did get tiring. 
So just persevering day after day, learning, recognizing the end goals that I had for myself and learning when to take a break too. It doesn't have to be STEM, STEM, STEM all the time. I ended up taking a a month break from the AI project because I just needed a little break from it all, from college applications and my course load. And it ended up being okay at the end. So I would think perseverance and determination and keeping a sight of your end goal for either a project or an internship or the STEM program that you're participating in. And the second thing I would say to that for my factor is confidence, especially since imposter syndrome is very real. It is definitely sometimes, sometimes you don't think you're good enough to be in a particular program or think that you're going to score any awards. But I think from getting support and having that determination can combine together to make you confident enough that you'll understand the concepts or you're knowledgeable enough to be in that situation or circumstance or have the confidence enough that you will get to that point one day. And I think that second point took me a little longer to realize, but I think is the more important part, recognizing that one day you will get to that point, one day very soon. So you should have confidence in yourself that you should keep learning and one day you'll get to that point. Now, I know a little bit about your career pathway, getting into STEM, which is not where you started to think um, many years ago. But you know, a career pathway is a workforce development strategy to support transitions from education into and through the workforce. Can you talk a little bit about your career pathway into STEM um, and what experiences have influenced this, these choices? Yeah, so for my career pathway, it was, it was a full journey. So I think I wanted to know, I wanted to go into STEM mainly from my older sister. I was kind of at that impressionable age where I just wanted to be like her in so many ways. So when I was like in elementary school, that's when she learned, she was, at, she was in high school at the time, she wanted to become a pediatrician. So I was like, okay, I want to be a pediatrician too, just because she wants to be one. However, once I took those introductory um, science classes in middle school, it made me realize the, the whole world of biology and how there's so many different areas. And I think that time made me realize that there are so many different job fields besides being a doctor that I should just step away or not think about being a doctor and explore other pathways while I was in middle school. So especially since like, if you ask a younger kid, name a STEM, prof- name a profession in the STEM field, they would say a doctor. So at the time I didn't know any STEM field. So when someone would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up in middle school, I would be say something in the STEM field, but not a doctor. Cause I thought there was more important professions out there. So when I got into the first two years of high school I didn't really do any STEM related projects or internships. So I was kind of just getting my inspiration off what I watched on TV. So I think in eighth grade, I watched the movie Hidden Figures and I wanted to go into astronomy because I thought the work they were doing was so cool. And then after a few months in ninth grade, I actually watched the show Grey's Anatomy. And something I found really interesting in that show that I really liked is the ability that doctors could see patients on the side and they could also do clinical trials and research while seeing patients. But as a freshman, I didn't really know how to get into that exact career pathway. So I opted for a more easier one I saw on the show, which was like needle natal surgery. I liked how that was perceived on the show. So I I pursued that. And then when I got to my sophomore year of high school, that's when I got to do the apprenticeship challenge, which was an after school research program at Brockton High. And After doing that internship or doing that um, program, that gave me my little introduction into research and ended up really liking it. Even though the results I got from that internship wasn't the best, I was still able to get another internship at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute the following summer. And I think the Dana-Farber Cancer Internship made me realize for a fact that I wanted to do research, at least going into my undergrad and potentially in the future. And from then on, just speaking to other people and 
speaking to other people in the STEM profession, that kind of gave me a sense of where I wanted to go in my career pathway. So I had the pleasure of speaking to multiple different physician scientists, and I really enjoyed the work that they did and thought that that was very interesting. So as of right now, I intend to follow that career path into my undergrad. And as for like the type of specialty that I was thinking about, I kind of held off on choosing a specific path on that. Cause I know people since the freshman year of high school that knew they were going to be a neurosurgeon at X hospital and work with Y types of patients. And although good for them that they have such a specific site, I felt like what would happen if I were to do that? And then I go into undergrad and I'm in my fourth year and realize that's not what I want to do anymore. And I spent so much energy and spent so much experience on that one thing just to realize that I don't want to do it anymore. That seems like a kind of scary circumstance. So I've been for my past three years and for my next four years, I have been trying out different areas and sciences to see what I like ranging from oncology to entomology, what I'm doing in my current work at Massasoit. And funny enough, I, there's always a reason, there's always something in each field to be interested in. Yeah, I Isabel, you're, you're a unique student in that way. Um, and I've watched you grow over the past couple of years and it's been absolutely amazing. You know, Isabel, many attendees here are going to be interested in increasing the number of underrepresented students in STEM. What advice do you have for them about programs and practices you believe might increase the numbers of students interested in and succeeding in STEM studies and pursuing STEM careers? For STEM programs, I think advertising that it is an introductory lab course or a science course would be very beneficial even if maybe those students might have a little bit more STEM experience in their belt. I think that creating a good foundation for students now can definitely help them in the future with future possibilities outside that program. So I think making the, it introductory and having ways to teach students that have absolutely no knowledge in STEM, those introductory or basic concepts can definitely help them and help them be interested. And also for a second thing on that, I would take the concepts slow in those in those programs, because I noticed in like the beginning, the beginning projects or the beginning um, science programs that I did, I found that the courses were a little fast. And I've seen people lose interest in STEM programs because they felt since those con they were running through the concepts so fast, they don't think that they were smart enough to continue in the program or pursue another type of program. So I would say take the concepts a little slow and also be open that there's a learning curve in within the program. I think especially what I thought is in, especially in those beginning STEM experience I had, I thought there was an expectation that I'm supposed to understand every single concept perfectly the first time that it was told to me. And after a while, it puts a lot more stress on me and anxiety on me because sometimes I would forget or sometimes some, I'm just not the perfect student or no one's the perfect student. No one's gonna understand every concept the first time. So I think if you'd be open that open about the challenge of the course and that there's gonna be a learning curve and one day they will understand it, I think that would help them understand. And especially if you acknowledge that there's gonna be a learning curve, it would make the students feel more accepted that they're struggling at one point in the class. And another way that I would say to get more kids to get into the STEM program or just into STEM careers is doing career panels or introducing your students into different STEM professions from all over the map in biology. I, as of right now, when every single person I know that's majoring in biology going into college, they're either doing pre-med or they intend on being a doctor or surgeon, or they have no idea what their major, or they have no idea what their profession's gonna be. So I think showing them the, there's so many different career paths within biology could allow them early on to point out which professions they wanted to pursue in the future. Um, thank you so much, Isabel. <laughs> um, I know that you're trying to get ready to go off to college. We are so absolutely um, proud of you. 
And uh, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy your time at Yale. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Pat and Isabel. Um, President Douglas, I'll ask you to begin uh, the panel now. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. And I want to start off by letting uh, you know that that was the most uh, wonderful uh, discussion, Isabel. You have really helped us to understand what it's like to be in the shoes of a student. And it really helps us to be better educators and better leaders. So thank you all for attending today. I'm so glad that you've decided to participate in this um, event today. And our focus, let me remind you, is on urban and suburban community STEM and DEI models for making positive change. I am Laura Douglas, president of Bristol Community College, and I also serve as the chair for the Connect Partnership Board. Uh, Bristol Community College has four locations in southeastern Massachusetts. We have a, a campus in Attleboro, in Taunton, in Fall River, and New Bedford. And this is a very important topic to us at Bristol. Uh, our vision is advancing a vibrant, diverse community through education, learner by learner. It is my privilege to be surrounded by so many talented and uh, knowledgeable educators today. And we're gonna start our panel off by asking each of our panelists to make a quick introduction. And then we're going to move on to some questions. So we're gonna start with the Brockton area and I'm gonna ask Dr. David Mangus to introduce himself. So good morning, um, I'm Dave Mangus. I'm the science department head at Brockton High School. As many of you know, Brockton is a gateway city with large minority and immigrant populations. The Brockton Public Schools is the fourth largest school district in the state with more than 15,000 students. And Brockton High School is the largest public high school in the Commonwealth with almost 4,000 students. Beginning next week, I'll be entering my 10th year with the district. For the first seven years, I worked to create a four-year non-vocational biotechnology pathway with the goal of having more students choose careers that support biotechnology throughout the Commonwealth. The program has grown dramatically over the years and now serves roughly 420 students, um, freshmen to seniors. In these classes, students are challenged to explore fundamental concepts in biology using um, engineering as a perspective. More importantly though, they're provided opportunities to learn about career opportunities in STEM. Using this approach, students are not just given the opportunity to see what STEM careers exist, but also envision themselves in these positions as well. To do this, we have established collaborative relationships with wonderful partners like Mass Higher Greater Brockton, the Anjan Foundation, Smith and Nephew, Tufts Medical School Center for Integrated Management of Antimicrobial Resistance and Harvard's Department of Stem Cell and Regenerative Biology. To give you a quick example of the impact this has had on our students, I want to share a message one of our students sent to her guidance counselor during a panel discussion with the Harvard Stem Cell Panel last fall. She wrote, it is so inspiring to see how many Latinos and Hispanics are talking in a conference that I'm on now and how they are proud of their backgrounds. And this makes me think if they are able to do it, why wouldn't I? Two years ago, I transitioned to my new role as department head where I currently work with 33 other science faculty. It's my goal that together we will be able to promote diversity and equity by helping provide mirrors, the mirrors all of our students need to see themselves in STEM careers. Thank you. Bishop Tony Branch. Good morning and blessings to everyone. Can you hear me clearly? I had some technology difficulties between my Max Pro uh, and my desktop, but I am hopefully uh, I, this technology is working. Uh, I'm, again, good morning and blessings to everyone. I'm Bishop Tony Branch serving as the first vice president of the uh, NAACP branch here uh, in the Brockton area. I also serve as vice chair 
of the Southeastern Regional School Committee uh, encompassing nine different communities. Uh, I am chair of personnel and chair of policy with respect to that committee. Uh, but uh, listen, I am a long-term uh, civil rights leader across this Commonwealth, uh, being homeless as a teen during high school, uh, understanding um, that education saved my life, uh, literally saved my life. Uh, I am an individual that uh, as a teen, I would be on Tremont Street in Boston because I was homeless, eating uh, out of the trash of the McDonald's that were left by kids because I feared that the adult uh, food would in fact have disease. So I understand the pain of our teens. I understand the difficulties that they have faced in our education system. What I've done for over 30 years, I've worked so hard um, my mentor was school committee member John D. O'Brien in Boston. I was in Roxbury at that time. Uh, and I can tell you that a part of our work has been to destroy the myth that black and Latino or Latinx children uh, lack the ability to learn. Uh, and that has, been, that has been a pretty strong uh, issue uh, within public education, that somehow our kids can't learn and that we have to do so many different things. Uh, our children are born to learn, just like white children. Um, so again, I've been on a pathway of destroying the myth that includes having professionals, whether there are teachers, whether there are administrators, whether there are power professionals that look like us, that understand the lens from which we are coming. So I thank you all for allowing me to participate in this. I serve as chair of the Commission on Diversity for the city of Brockton. Uh, so I've done a lot of investigative work with respect uh, to personal matters in our city. Um, and I continue to kind of um, do that work uh, as a consultant as well. Uh, so again, thank you, thank you, thank you for all of this collaboration because it is much needed. But I, I also want us not to lose, not to be disconnected because Isabel has said some important words that we shouldn't forget. She said, people that cared enough found her to be important and instilled confidence in her where she would have perseverance. This speaks to what we're talking about in terms of diversity. So let's be blessed in our conversations and thank you. Well said, thank you. Paul Engel. Good morning, everyone, and uh, uh, good morning, Stacey and Catherine. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today, and, and President Douglas, thank you for, for moderating this, this panel. Uh, um, to to, to um, piggyback on, on Dr. Mangus, um, Brockton is, is an urban city. It's a, a, it's a um, minority-majority city, and I am privileged to be the library director for the Brockton Public Library which has three branches, the main branch and east and west branch. Um, and I'd like to really start out by, by inviting everybody on this call to uh, come on down to the library, uh, be it my library or the library in your town. If you are in a zone of living where you can volunteer, we welcome volunteers, especially within the STEM and STEAM programs that we do. If you're uh, a young parent or a younger person, come down and, and, and engage in the programs that we have. Uh, the library, the public library in America is the people's institution and you should never forget that. You can learn anything at the library and you can, you can educate yourself beyond your wildest imaginations. Now with that said, um, we do a lot, everything that we do in the library, its lens is around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Everything we do from the collections that we develop to the programs we put on. Um, we have an ESL program uh, that is, and a citizenship program that is outstanding. Uh, to talk about a little bit about um, the, the um, collaborations that we do, uh, we work very closely with, with Bishop Branch and with, uh, and with the NAACP in Brockton. Uh, we, Phyllis Ellis happens to be a trustee of the library as well. Phyllis is the president of the NAACP in Brockton. Uh, we run something that Pat mentioned earlier called AXO. Uh, the first time we did AXO that I was at the helm, 
uh, Pat came in and took over the entire uh, library, 47,000 square feet of AXO. And uh, we've continued in the virtual reality, in the virtual world as well. Um, we also have, uh, as Pat mentioned also, the makerspace, which, which Pat was instrumental in getting that off the ground just prior to my arrival. Uh, since I've gotten there, the makerspace has really expanded into something quite magical. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the day that we can get back to, to doing in-person things in the makerspace. But Pat has combined a lot of things with, uh, with science, engineering, technology, and math in the makerspace. Uh, we have purchased recently a huge collection of library of things. So we've added uh, uh, scales and telescopes and uh, musical instruments and uh, all sorts of STEM things that are not bubbling up in my brain right now. Um, the, um, the final thing I want to mention is that we have received a, um, a $50,000 ARPA grant from the federal government to purchase a mobile planetarium which will be part of our makerspace and part of our library of things. So that would be available to any, any uh, faculty or, or teacher at any, any, any area in, the, in Brockton to use in their classrooms. We will also be running uh, programs with that mobile planetarium. And um, it's, it's gonna be wonderful. And I look forward to, to many, many years uh, at the helm at Brockton. I look forward to, uh, to being, um, uh, uh, make a difference, as, as Tony said, make a difference in everybody's life in, in, in the city. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're now going to shift to East Bridgewater, and I'd like Gina Williams to introduce herself. Gina. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gina Williams. I'm the assistant superintendent here in East Bridgewater. Uh, East Bridgewater is a, a suburb. Um, I think when Dr. Magnus had mentioned uh, 15,000 students in the Brockton Public Schools, that's more than the total population of East Bridgewater. Um, however, it does not make uh, the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, any less important uh, in the town of East Bridgewater. Um, because we are a small district, um, people wear many hats. Um, and in my role, uh, I oversee professional development uh, as well as curriculum and instruction uh, and a lot of uh, family and community outreach as well. So uh, of the work that we've been doing, and I'm, I'm glad I have Karen Clifford with me here today and, and she'll share with you uh, all the hats she wears uh, in our school district. Um, Julia Sheehan, unfortunately, was not able to join us this morning, uh, but she is a teacher here, a social studies teacher here in the district. Uh, and in addition to being a, a social studies teacher, she actually uh, leads our, our task force on race. Uh, that is a district-wide task force uh, made up of the educators here uh, within the, the school district. Um, we have a, a new coalition that's formed in town, so we work closely with them. As far as the work that we're doing, um, you know, a lot of the things that Isabel said really uh, rung true as far as the connections we make with our students. Uh, and we're really noticing the importance of us starting younger and younger, starting as early as kindergarten uh, with looking at career paths and introducing students to different career opportunities um, and the professional development we do with our teachers so that they know the importance of making those connections, knowing their students, encouraging and supporting their students. Um, so that the work that we're doing is kind of uh, from both ends of the spectrum, making sure that our teachers receive the professional development that they need uh, so that they're breaking down those barriers that are exi existing, that are preventing students from uh, feeling that they um, can do anything they want to do and they have uh, the ability to do anything they put their, their mind to. Um, and making their rooms more inclusive. Um, you know, we're looking uh, to, to speak to, you know, the, the conversation that was just had about the importance of the library, uh, the books that these students are reading, the books that students are, are reading, even from young ages, that they see themselves in these oh, stories. Uh, yeah. And really looking at our curriculum and making sure that we have uh, diverse characters in our, our stories that our young students are reading and uh, opportunities for our oldest students to see all the the possibilities uh, that their their careers can take them in. So working with our staff, um, and Karen's going to talk a little bit about the work we're doing with students and introducing them to career paths, even at young ages, uh, before they're even considering uh, what they want to do um, beyond high school. So I'm so glad to be here. I'm actually um, I was flattered. I, I, I don't think we have all the answers. Um, but we're 
getting our hands wet with the work and uh, making sure that we're reaching out to area districts who are also doing a lot of work uh, and making a lot of gains. Uh, I want to mention Easton Public Schools because they've been a great resource to us as well. Um, so glad to be here. Thanks so much. And we're going to move to our business workforce panelists. We're going to start with David Vincent. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, David Vincent, and I am the Director of uh, Youth Employment at Mass Hire Greater Brockton Workforce Board. Uh, Mass Hire is uh, actually one of 16 workforce boards in Massachusetts uh, that is responsible uh, to oversee workforce uh, development initiatives for the Brockton region. Uh, our region is uh, the city of Brockton and nine surrounding towns, uh, which is Avon, uh, Abington, all of the Bridgewaters, Easton, Hanson, uh, Stoughton, and Whitman. I have been here for 11 and a half years, and uh, my role here at uh, Mass Hire is uh, I provide career uh, services uh, uh, to in-school and out-of-school young people between the ages of 14 to 24. Uh, and our goal is to really expose young people uh, to different uh, career exploration activities similar to Isabel, um, or train and retrain young people to become more employable uh, for today's uh, very active and competitive uh, job market, as well as the future. Um, some of our services uh, we offer are career trainings, educational services, um, employment, internship opportunities, and professional development workshops uh, within our youth career center. And I will say that everything that we do here uh, at Mass Hire is predicated and supported by labor market information, as you'll see on our website. Uh, but importantly, the data uh, that we collect from our research uh, serves as a guide uh, to help uh, us dictate what types of in-demand occupational programs and activities uh, we should be offering to our, cu our customers. Uh, so in our region, uh, we uh, focus on some of the top occupations uh, that are within STEM industries, that is healthcare, um, advanced manufacturing, and finance, all of which are career trainings uh, are all of which are career training programs that we currently run throughout the year round. And so I'm, I'm happy to be here and um, I hope that uh, I could provide as much information as possible about more uh, about what we do. And um, thank you for having me this morning. Thank you. And Paula Martel. Good morning. I'm trying to unmute myself. Uh, I'm Paula Martell, and I am the Human Resources Manager for Northeastern Machine, an advanced manufacturer in Easton, Massachusetts, uh, that is uh, 57 years old, uh, family owned and operated. Uh, I also sit on the board of directors of Mass Hire, uh, Greater Brockton, and uh, on the STEM uh, it, advisory committee, as well as we're partners in Southeast Mass Advanced Manufacturing Consortium, a group of businesses in Southeast Mass working in advanced manufacturing and trying to further uh, the career paths of those students and young people in the region. Um, my job really is outreach, uh, student outreach specifically, um, we uh, So what is an advanced manufacturer is the first question I usually get. Um, our parents would have called it a machine shop. Uh, it would have been uh, run by hand mostly. Today it's a mechanized computer driven environment that makes components for high tech industries, the US military, um, battery technology, satellites, all sorts of uh, industries um, in the U.S., mostly industries that are controlled and overseen for either safety, like the FDA, we made a number of components for um, the fight against COVID, for example, uh, or airplanes, the FAA, we do uh, fuel um, system work. So my focus is outreach and engagement, uh, student internships of, for students of all ages. We work with students from kindergarten 
through community college and um, at UMass uh, doing uh, vocational internships in our machine shop, as well as engineering internships to expose engineers to um, the maker space. Uh, similar to what would start in the Brockton Public Library with Paul, can be really transitioned into real world, real parts kind of work uh, for actual customers, giving students uh, the responsibility and the option to see themselves in STEM, as we all say. Um, careers in advanced manufacturing offer a lot of entry points uh, and offer opportunities for students of color and women uh, that provide uh, job equity, as well as a higher than average income level uh, for the region. So my work with David and his colleagues tell us that many of the communities in Southeast Mass have a depressed uh, income level, uh, especially in communities of color. And for many of the students who we work with who ultimately become our employees, their entry level pay is greater as an individual than the household income of many of these families. Uh, so we see work in STEM fields and specifically in machining and manufacturing as opportunities for advancement, um, both uh, from a, from a uh, financial equity position at least. Uh, businesses can aid students uh, some of what I've already heard this morning, that a career panel is very helpful to students understanding STEM opportunities and entry points. Um, you can graduate high school from a vocational program and get a job at Northeastern Machine making in, a, in excess of $40,000 a year as a base salary, uh, and then going on to community college and uh, a baccalaureate program offers some additional opportunities. So we can see students entering the workforce at a variety of uh, points. So businesses really do need to, to make the effort to uh, educate students as to um, careers that are close by to home in their community, serving their communities um, all the time. Um, and that could be a career panel. It could be manufacturing day a day at the first Friday in October when manufacturers nationwide are encouraged to open their doors and allow students to come in tour um, or to become involved. Uh, East Bridgewater mentioned assistance from Easton. Easton has a STEAM team, a community-based program uh, that is involving businesses in the community with the school department. I do programs at the junior high level with Bristol Plymouth Vocational. We're doing uh, programs with kindergarten level students. So being able to show students of all ages and all backgrounds, uh, female and male, that uh, STEM opportunities um, exist and that everyone is smart enough to work in a STEM field. Thanks. Thank you. I inadvertently skipped over Karen Clifford. I'm sorry, Karen, would you quickly introduce yourself and then we'll get to our questions. Thank you. No worries. Good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to be here and part of the panel. Um, this is exciting work, like Dr. Williams had said. My role in East Bridgewater is the Director of Guidance for the district. So I am working on the programming for K all the way through 12. One of my primary areas is social emotional learning, which encompasses all students. I also am part of the Professional Development Academy. Um, as I said, the social emotional learning developing curriculum and I recently wrote and was awarded a three-year career vocational grant for students in grades six through eight. So we are entering year two in that grant. So we've been able to open up a lot of exciting programming, exciting for Little East Bridgewater programming for all students. So I look forward to participating in the panel today. 
Thanks, Thank Karen. And thanks to all of our panelists. There's so much information to share. And as we look at the clock, we only have 15 minutes or so left. So I'm, got, I'm gonna ask each panelist when you uh, get your question, just to boil it down to a one minute response. I know you can't get everything in there, but maybe you can come uh, share your most salient point. We're gonna start with uh, Dr. David Mangus. How are Brockton Public Schools working to make STEM open and accessible to all middle and high school students? Awesome, uh, thanks for the question. So in my opening remarks, I mentioned giving students the opportunity to see themselves reflected in STEM careers. Other great ways to promote equity include providing students agency over their learning, building their confidence by learning science skills and developing professional networks. I believe our most important initiative is implementing argument-driven inquiry in our middle and high school classrooms. ADI uh, activities promote equity by engaging students in the process of doing science. Their authentic nature generates real-world connections for st student learning. Students design their own experiments to address disciplinary core ideas instead of being prescribed how to engage with the curriculum. Through the practice of fundamental literacy and math skills, students are able to increase their proficiency in the science practices. Together, these routines create a student-centered learning environment that makes activities personal and engaging. In an opportunity separate from our biotech pathway, you heard Isabel talk this morning about the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center Apprenticeship Program and how it prepares uh, our students for summer intern internships. Students in the program commit to intensive training after school three days a week for nine weeks for well in excess of 65 hours to learn the math, technical and interpersonal skills necessary to work in an academic or commercial life sciences laboratory. With the confidence learned in this program, many of our students go on to work at prestigious institutions like the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center, the Forsyth Institute, the Reagan Institute, and Mass Biologics, as well as academic partners, Massachusetts Community College and Bridgewater State University. Finally, another way that we are working uh, to help promote interest in STEM is to de develop our science seminar program. This program is based on the Berg Science Seminar model implemented in high schools across America during the space race of the 1960s. The goal is to increase student interest in science and engineering by allowing them to actively participate in these processes. Students enrolling in the program complete their own original research project to enter in the school-wide science fair. Each Monday after school, students either learn from scientists about career topics or work with mentors to design and improve their own research projects. Many of the presenters are Brockton High School alumni. Taken together, these programs will provide greater equity for our students and in the long term promote diversity in STEM careers as more people of color fill STEM jobs. Thank you. Bishop Tony Branch, in your experience as a member of the NAACP and the Southeast Regional School Committee, as well as a leader in a faith based community organization, what are some of the maybe just one or two activities or programs that you believe are effective in shaping the skills and knowledge and mindset that our students need to be successful? Well, you know, I know that, as you all know, I'm a preacher, so I can go a long time. Uh, but one of the things that you pointed out, you said mindset. And what we're finding is that kids that look like me, again, I have for you for decades believed that science, technology, engineering, and math were not a part of the equation of their life. And the reason why I talk in this lens is for all of us to understand these kids that you're looking at that look like me come from a history of, of folks saying that they can't do it, that they can't do it. Uh, so for me, it's the academic conversation that I have when I'm doing this consultant work, where I tell people diversity benefits everyone, where I'm trying to modeling, where we're modeling now that it is value versus race. Stop calling people racist, where everything now is evidence-based. Let's look at the data uh, of where we're starting from and that we have a long vision. One of the things that I'm concerned about is people are not really recognizing that at this point in our nation, there's a huge pushback on diversity that is going to impact the work that we're doing with respect to STEM. 
This is very, very true. So we really got to start unpacking a conversation where we say, and I'm going to say this to all of us on this call, we are cousins of each other. I look, I'm brown skin, and you may look vanilla, but we are actually, as a human race, cousins of each other. So we have to have this conversation as a family around diversity so the children that want to do the, 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 the work in STEM realize that they're going to be successful. One of the things that Isabel, that keeps, I keep going back to that because I want people to look at our life experience as children of color. Perseverance, that perseverance that she requires throughout her career means that people like me need to be in a room with her, yes? But people like you need to be encouraging her as well. And it can't be based upon we having these conversations around diversity. It has to be all of us recognizing her value as a human being. So what works in terms of activities? Destroying the myth that black and brown can't learn. What works in terms of policies? Making sure that these businesses truly have an open door beyond October. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Uh, what, what, what truly works is me as a policy a Caesar on, on my particular school committee to make sure that we're going to have equity, that everybody has an equal chance to get this, uh, get these programs, get these academics, and to get it right. And what I'm really, really concerned about is that when we look at public education, when we look at a majority of our pupils, yeah, I'm old, so I said pupils, a majority of our pupils are 70, 80 percent black. Why aren't we sort of fast-tracking them in advanced manufacturing or, or opening. We got the major hospitals. We have major corporations. We have life sciences in Cambridge. There's no excuse for any failure in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you. And for Paul Engel, could you give us an example of a collaboration between the Brockton Public Library and the NAACP or the Brockton branch in terms of STEM programming? Sure. Um, I mentioned it in my, in my opening remarks, and I, I'm going to go back to it. Uh, the, the AXO program that we, we run in the library is, is really phenomenal, and it, it ties into what Bishop Branch was talking about, that, um, the, that we're fast-tracking uh, students of color uh, and really encouraging them and, and, and really showing them that, they, yes, they do have the ability to learn. And I've had the pleasure of, of judging the AXO competitions for several years now at, in, in the music categories. My background is in music. Uh, and um, I, I've heard some phenomenal people uh, playing, you know, and, 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 and working in that, in, in that environment. Uh, the other thing we do with the NAACP that I didn't mention in my opening remarks is, is we host a STEM week there. Uh, it's in October, and it's another one of these events that, that when we're in, in real time, we take over the entire library. Uh, this STEM week is going to be, I'm not sure if it's virtual or not, because I'm not sure what's going on with the world, but um, we will have another STEM week in October, and, and uh, I invite you all to, to uh, come and see it. Uh, finally, I'm going to send you my, um, put my email in, in the uh, chat. If you have any questions about the library or anything that we're doing at the library, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to Gina Williams. Gina, how does East Bridgewater Public Schools collaborate with Mass Hire of Greater Boston? And uh, what is an important outcome of this effort? Uh, it wasn't actually until last spring where I was first introduced to Mass Hire. Uh, we had a student that was interested in an internship. Um, so we worked with Mass Hire to create a paid internship. And I guess one of the positive things that has come out of um, COVID learning um, is our seniors were allowed an open campus concept where they only needed to take the courses that they needed to um, graduate and they did not need to take electives. And it was obviously a way for us to reduce the number of students on campus. But what it has opened up for us is the understanding that we need to create other pathways for students. We can't have students sitting in classrooms, taking classes that they don't need to be taking. We need to uh, provide them with opportunities for if it's dual enrollment, if it's an internship, if it's workforce, uh, we need to create those opportunities. I think Isabel mentioned kids are really busy and they're trying to juggle everything and they're getting 
lack of sleep at night because they're trying to fit it all in. We need to work better during the school day for these students. So for us, it's creating alternative spring semesters for our seniors so that they can be pursuing uh, what's gonna make them most successful. So for us, it's getting those exposure and experiences early so that when our students are ready to leave high school, um, they have a better understanding of what they're capable of doing and feeling confident about pursuing those next steps. Thank you. Perfect segue into our next question for Karen Clifford, which is how are East Bridgewater Public School students introduced to career pathways? As I, as I mentioned, my role is the director of guidance from K to 12. So our curriculum starts in kindergarten that our elementary school students have had during COVID exposure to virtual um, community members that talked about their career. The middle school, we now have a, a grant for six to eight, but all students in the middle school building participate in a STEAM class that they meet and do hands-on projects. We have a STEAM night for the entire district in the fall. And at the high school, we continue, well, the junior senior high school is seven through 12. So we continue with the grant work, bridging the gap from one building to the next, as well as we have career day and guidance picks up with interest inventories, skill, skills assessments. We are developing, as Dr. Williams said, the course pathways for more specific routes into STEM instead of students um, just meeting their graduation requirements. We're trying to be more intentional and purposeful with their course work that they do and developing the, um, the internship program. So that is the introduction that students from K all the way through 12 learn this, that is their pathway, is that they are gonna explore all of those options. Thank you. We're gonna switch back to Gina for this question, which is how do you introduce DEI to your colleagues in the East Bridgewater Public Schools and what has the impact been? Sure, and this was um, initially going to be Julia's question and Julia is a, a teacher here within the district. So uh, it was actually a, a grassroots effort uh, on behalf of teachers here within the district. Um, as Karen mentioned, we have a professional development academy, which is made up of representatives of teachers and administrators throughout the district. We plan the professional development. Our task force on race um, actually came to the professional development academy with a, a plan for how we could um, support teachers in their journey of, of a better understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and uh, creating anti-racist classrooms and educating their students. Um, they've also developed plans at the administrative level, how we can be looking at our policies and our hiring practices uh, so that uh, we're more diverse in, in recruitment uh, and um, retainment of, of staff. Um, so I really do need to give credit to, to Julia uh, and her colleagues because um, they are really doing the work uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I think I also mentioned we've spent professional development time, them just reviewing curriculum and materials to make sure that um, we're culturally responsive in the materials and resources that we use with students. Um, and our overarching goal is to just break down all barriers that prevent students from reaching their full potential. Thanks so much, Gina. So uh, our next question goes to David Vincent. David, there are 16 mass hire centers in Massachusetts and the Brockton region is very large. Um, YouthWorks offers universal access to a system of year round workforce development programs for people 18 to 24. What programs are available for youth and how do people find out about them? And, and lastly, how do you work with the school districts uh, in, uh, to collaborate? Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, so, well, I'll highlight that uh, Mass Hire has a lot of uh, STEM focused events, um, activities and programs. Uh, for events, uh, we host a, a STEM career exploration uh, event every uh, spring uh, with our partner, Bridgewater State uh, University. And uh, the goal of that event is to expose young people uh, to a variety of uh, STEM careers. Uh, we also normally, um, pre-COVID uh, in the fall, we host a, a construction career day event uh, that uh, is designed to educate youth about various careers in 
construction and engineer industries. As far as activities, um, we also uh, we work with uh, Northeast Eastern Machine. Um, we do company tours with Paula and her team. We bring high school students over there uh, to visit uh, her company. Um, and then recently, we actually purchased artificial artificial intelligence uh, hand from Neuromaker. Uh, so we're planning to implement uh, their program so that young people could learn how to code and explore the path of AI. Uh, we also um, purchased Oculus virtual reality headsets uh, that will allow uh, some of our young people the chance to experience interactive simula uh, simulators virtually for uh, several STEM occupations. And then we have plenty of programs, but um, um, for the sake of the conversation in, in STEM, uh, we run a banking and finance program for uh, young people uh, 18 and up. Uh, it's a six week occupational uh, training program that prepares young people how to become a bank teller. And then we're also looking to uh, capture some of the finance side, uh, looking at different training opportunities for that. Um, and then we're also just uh, off offering lean manufacturing training as well. So we have plenty of uh, opportunities for young people. We work with the high school. Uh, we have a um, connecting activities uh, liaison uh, who's in uh, all of our partner schools within the uh, catchment areas that I, I mentioned earlier. And so um, we definitely would like to uh, continue to grow our programs. And for more information, just please uh, reach out to me uh, either directly, I can put my information in the chat, or um, I'll have uh, the uh, moderator uh, send that out afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, David. It's so exciting to hear about the AI that you're introducing. That is a great way to introduce students to new technology. Uh, it's a chance that many students don't have. So that's just fantastic. We're going to end with Paula Martel uh, with the last question, which is why is it important for businesses to connect with students as part of their career exploration activities, in particular, young students and their parents? Well, I think it's important because, as Isabel said, she was unaware of STEM. People tell me all the time, I was unaware of STEM careers. I don't know what an engineer does. Um, so I think that it's important to connect with parents, both to educate them about options available in the community for their student. And it's important to connect, especially with girls, because I think that girls prior to the junior high age that become interested in STEM careers uh, tend to be able to sustain that through uh, high school years when people, um, students, other students, boys, um, sometimes the school system uh, kind of gives them some messages that STEM isn't for them or STEM for them is to be a nurse. Um, so to introduce a wide diversity to students at a young age and their parents gives us better chances uh, to make them feel capable and do away with Isabel's concerns about imposter syndrome and all of those things that plague kids and adolescents that maybe we can uh, set some roots and some seeds early uh, and make STEM uh, more accessible to everyone all the time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paula. And I wanna thank all of our panelists for their excellent input. We could go forever and ever. I know we have just scratched the surface, but hopefully you've all made some great contacts today uh, through this panel. And uh, I wanna encourage all of you to reach out to one, one another. We're all in this together and together we will make Southeastern Massachusetts just that much stronger in STEM. So let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you very much. And now I would like to turn the program over to Stacy Kaminsky. Stacy. Thank you very much, President Douglas, and thank you for your excellent facilitation of the panel. We had 
so many talented experts here today. And as you said, and I would like to reiterate, um, there's just so much information for all of you to be able to share with one another. Um, certainly, I know a few of you have put your contact information in the chat. Um, and Catherine and I have all of your contact information. And as I mentioned, um, we will be including links to your organizations um, on the resource um, site or on the resource page that goes out either later this week or at the beginning of next week. So you'll certainly all be able to connect with one another. But um, thank you again, President Douglas. Thank you again to all of the presenters and um, panelists and to Isabel as well for being here.